Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So the pastor, I've, I've preached on this text a lot of times. Um, never like I have today. We're looking at gratitude and we're looking at thanksgiving. And uh, this particular Sunday is going to be a little bit more serious. It's going to be a little bit deeper maybe. What I'm hoping it's going to do is set you free for the next three. This is going to be, I hope, a month of celebration. But sometimes we've got to know what it is we're celebrating. And so I want to turn to the reading. Jesus asked. We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give thanks to God except for this foreigner? Don't you just hate it when Jesus asks questions? The theme for this Sunday is grateful receiving. And I know that's a bit awkward and it's probably a bit surprising because you might talk about grateful giving or grateful living because we tend to be, as American Christians, so I focused. What do you want from me, God? Today, I want you to be God-focused and see what he's doing for you. Because I don't know that we can live gratefully or that we can give gratefully or do anything if we haven't received gratefully. We're not all ten cleansed. Did not all ten receive God's grace and God's mercy? This whole thing starts out exactly the way it should, you know. Hear me clearly. When life starts to get sucky, you do what these guys did. Lord, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. That is a good place to begin when you don't understand what life's doing. As my bride says, it's not that everything in our lives are, that we can wrap our, our arms around and go, man, I'm so thankful this is happening to me. I get it. I get it. I have seven kids. I get it. We're not all ten cleansed. See, this is the sticking point. See, God is always merciful. God is always gracious. God is always good. I already said that even if I'm faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. John tells us that God is love. Absolutely unconditional love. His love doesn't change or is not affected by whether you love him or not. When we begin to realize that the God of the universe doesn't shift and, and move like we do. He is always loving. He is always providing. He is always giving. He is always because he just absolutely loves you. He created you because he loves you. But I do bad things, and I'm a sinner, and I, he knows that. I mean, that's not escaping his notice. That's why he sent Jesus into the world, to die for your sins, to bridge the gap, 
God loves you so much that he would rather die for you than live without you. He doesn't just love some people and not others. He doesn't just kind of pour grace on some and not others. He is unilaterally, unconditionally loving no matter what. The question is, are we seeing it? And are we gratefully receiving it? Doggone it, you know, as a pastor, you think you're going to roll into November and do some sermons on Thanksgiving. This is going to be easy, right? Get you kind of skimming through, and God just pummels me all week long. Hey, Tom, are you the one or the nine, Tom? Sometimes I'm the one, Lord. I know. But Lord, but what? Is it possible that sometimes we so focus on ourselves? See, this is the problem. God said to Adam after he sinned, Who told you that you were naked? Who told you to look at yourself? Who told you to be self-absorbed? Who told you that it was all about you? I created you to love me with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul. I created you to love that woman as yourself. You've messed it all up. Love broke. You see, we have a tendency, and I said this yesterday to somebody, we have a tendency to think sin is doing bad things. Sin is not doing bad things. Sin is loving improperly, and so we do bad things. When we sin, love breaks. God, you're not loving me enough, so I'm going to go get love over here. You're not providing for me, so I'm going to go steal from over here. God, you blah, 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 blah. They didn't do just something bad in the garden. They broke love. They broke love. And so sometimes with God, we play let's make a deal, and we barter and everything, and he's going, I don't want to do it that way. I just want to love you, and I want you to love me. We create religious systems, and we jump through hoops, and we got to do this, and we got to do that, and he's going, stop it. Jesus tried to make it clear. He really did. Hey, teacher. Hey, Jesus. There's 640 commandments. Which one of them is the greatest? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to get to heaven? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is it. See, the problem is we don't love rightly. And I think this is, this is where all week long I've been pausing. We're not all hen cleansed. Yeah. God, you acted the way you always do. Then where are the other nine? If we're always receiving God's grace, then what causes some of us to receive it differently? What caused nine to receive it in such a way that they just kept going home and one had to turn back and give thanks? Hold on to that point. Because that's the question. If I answer that question tonight, today I've done my job. Do you know this is not the only place that he contrasts this kind of thing? In the story of the prodigal son, there is this son, two sons. They've lived in God's kingdom. They've lived with him. And all of a sudden, one son says, I'm tired of this. I want to leave and I want to go hang out. I want to do my own thing because I don't like living with you anymore. But by the way, could I have my inheritance? And the father says, yes. He graciously gives. 
son goes and squanders it all. Prostitutes and alcohol, drugs, whatever you want to call it, all of a sudden wakes up one day going, crud, what did I do? What did I do? This is not life. This is not. This, it was. I was better off when I was living in the in the protection of my father. I was better off. So he runs back, and the father runs out to him, and there's this amazing reunion where the father forgives him, and the father clothes him with a robe and puts a finger, a ring on his finger, and and says, "Let's party because this son that was dead is now alive." And 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 it's it's. You, we've all been there. We've all been there. You're here today because sometime in your life you've been that prodigal son and we're thankful that God receives us back and we go have a party. But somebody's missing. Somebody's not going into the party. And it's the older son. And the father finally realizes that his older son is not in the party. And so he goes out and he says to him, what are you doing out here? What are you doing out here? And he says to his father, that son of yours, my brother, squandered everything that you gave him and he has now returned and you're having a party. You put a robe on his finger. I mean, a robe on his back, a ring on his finger. You're, you're, you're having this... And I've been here the whole time, and you've never done anything for me. You've never done anything for me. You've never done anything for me. Son, how did you not know that everything I have is yours? How can you be living in my kingdom and not realizing it's all yours? You see, God's always giving, but what if we're not seeing it? What if we're not graciously and gratefully receiving it? What if we're like Peter saying, no, Jesus, you can't wash my feet, you know. You can wash their feet, but not my feet because I'm going to put on this false kind of humility thing. What if the problem is us? So we can't talk about grateful living. We can't talk about Thanksgiving. We can't talk about grateful uh, service. We can't talk about anything until we can figure out why sometimes we're the nine instead of the one. Why sometimes we're the prodigal son and we get it and sometimes we're the older son and like we're blind. But we don't see it. Jesus says there once was there 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 there, there was this, this very wealthy landowner and there was this servant that owed him a lot of money more money than he could ever pay that's our debt to God right how in the world do you ever allow someone to have a greater debt than they can ever pay love just talk to some parents here and what they provide for their kids We'll do anything for them. Love. So the landowner forgives the guy's debt. The whole thing. The guy doesn't lose his life. He doesn't lose his job. He doesn't lose his family. He doesn't go to prison. Man, bam. One moment, it's gone. One moment, we're looking at the cross, and we realize that our sins are forgiven. God's thrown as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers them no more. There is no more freeing moment than realizing that the whole gosh darn debt is gone. And then he says, that same servant had a buddy of his that owed him five bucks. And he beat him up because he couldn't pay back the debt and sent him to jail and ruined his life. And the master said to the first servant, what? What? I forgave you that debt. I forgave you that debt, that, that debt that you could not pay. And then you turned around and you treated another human being. How does that happen? 
how that happens is somehow we're like the nine instead of the one. Somehow we did not receive the right way. The guy's debt was completely eliminated. And even after he screwed up, God didn't say, okay, I'm going to put the debt back on you. You notice God, Jesus did not say to the one, you're cleansed, but the other nine, I'm putting their leprosy back on them. You can see him running back home, you know, and all of a sudden the leprosy goes back. They're all cleansed. They're all clean. Are you ready for the point of all this? It's love. And until we realize that it's all about love, we're going to miss the mark. God loves you, created you, redeemed you, promises to walk with you, promises to indwell you, even through the toughest of times. Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you should echo into your mind. He is like an envelopment. He's like a hug that promises to be there no matter what. I'm going to celebrate with you or I'm going to, I'm going to crawl with you, but we're going to get through this. That's the kind of God we got. And when you ask the question, why are you like that? He says, because I love you. And somewhere, that's it. See, somewhere, ten guys were running back, or ten lepers were running back to the city, wanting to see their families again, wanting to wrap their arms around their kids, wanting to get back to their jobs, wanting to get back to the things that they do. And all of a sudden, one of them goes, oh, wait a minute. What I just received came from a God who loved me. I'll get to that in a minute. And he runs back to Jesus and falls at his feet and worships him. Love made him do that. Because he figured out that what he received was based in God's love, he was compelled to love him back. Couldn't help it. Didn't have to think about it. It just couldn't have just... Here's another one. Here's another one. There was this guy named Simon the leper. I always wondered if he was one of the nine. He very well could have been one of the nine. Simon the leper was a Pharisee, and one day in the future, Jesus is walking through town, and Simon, who was walking dead out there as a leper, now back at home doing his job, he invites Jesus to dinner. That's cool. This is the guy that saved me. This is the guy that healed me. I'm going to invite him to dinner. Invites all his friends, family. They're having a great dinner. And all of a sudden, this woman busts in the room. She breaks open a vial of perfume that costs a year's wages. She pours it on Jesus' feet. She's weeping and she's crying and she's wiping her his feet with her hair. And, and, and. Everybody's watching the situation and smelling the situation. And all of a sudden, the Bible tells us that Simon, in one uh, writer, and, and, and the disciples in another uh, writer of the Gospels, says they began to get frustrated. Frustrated with her interruption. Frustrated with the fact that, that, that she's a woman. Frustrated with the fact that she's wasted all this money. Frustrated, 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 and Jesus says, stop. Simon, I came into your house and you did not wash my feet. Simon, I came into your house, the one who healed you, the one that saved you. I came into your house and you did not honor me. You did not weep at my feet. You did not fall at my feet and thank me and worship me. But this woman, she is loving me with a love that is uncontrollable. And her story will be told until I return. Why? Because she us.
brothers and sisters in Christ, today I want every single one of us to walk out of here as the one, not the nine. I want every one of us to be the woman who crashes into whatever they have to crash into to fall at Jesus' feet and to worship him. I want you to realize that the God of the universe loves you so much, he is weaving in your life and doing stuff and poking and moving. And, and yes, sometimes it's uncomfortable and sometimes you don't get it. Just know he loves you. Just know he loves you. And be a grateful receiver. Receive his love. It's hard, isn't it? I don't deserve it. You don't know me. Yes, he does. And he loves you anyways. He loves you. He simply wants you to love him back. And when that relationship begins, boy, everything starts to change. Because now it's like a marriage. Marriages go through tough times. Loss of jobs, money, relationship struggles, kids. It's all, yeah. But somehow God sees us through. So just a minute while I'm talking. Close your eyes. In the last few months, how has God reached into your life to tell you that he loves you? Don't focus on yourself right now and, oh, I didn't give thanks. Oh, just focus on the fact that he loves you. That the God of the universe, as he's spinning the planets around and taking care of business, wanted to make sure that he put his finger in your life. Glance up at the cross just for a second as you're standing at the base of the cross. And ask him why he's there. Why? Why are you doing that? And look him, watch him look you right in the eye and say, because I love you. Because I love you. Open your eyes. Be grateful receivers. I pray the Holy Spirit is causing your heart of faith to open wide and receive. Feels good, doesn't it? Feels good. Now, worship Him. Find time in your day, find time in your life to stop everything and worship Him. Before you know it, you're going to see more moments and find more room, more moments to thank him. And before you know it, it's going to like it's going to be like a yo-yo, back and forth, back and forth, because you're going to have all these moments where God's revealing Himself and you are praising Him. I want every single one of us to be the one who comes back because we're just compelled to. All right.